panelist today, Michael Schumann. Michael is an economist, attorney, author, and entrepreneur, and one of the world's leading experts on community economics. He has authored, co-authored, or edited eight books. His most recent book, just published by Chelsea Green, is The Local Economy Solution. Previously, his book, The Small Mart Revolution, How Local Businesses Are Beating the Global Competition, received a bronze prize from the Independent Publishers Association for Best Business Book. Uh, he is an adjunct instructor at Simon Fraser University and is a prolific speaker. Schumann has given an average of more than one invited talk per week, mostly to local governments and universities for the past 30 years. He has lectured in almost every U.S. state and eight countries. Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and uh, I've titled today's talk, pollinating food enterprises. And the word pollinator has special significance in what I'm going to be talking about today because I think most of you who are listening to this webinar are in fact pollinators. Uh, that is, your mission is not just to earn a bottom line for your business or a business that you're trying to create. You're trying to create multiple businesses to create a healthy local food system. And I believe that there is a way of approaching this uh, consistent with economic development that actually can be far more effective and help us to achieve our goals far more effectively. So I've been particularly interested in pollinators that are self-financing because clearly if you're self-financing you're able to get a lot more done. So. Um, I'd like to go uh, to this slide here about choice. If we had a lot of time here, I would ask you as a crowd a bunch of questions, and but I'll tell you what I think your answers would be. I would ask you, for example, how many of you have all the money you need for your projects? And basically, there would be no hands up. I would ask you how many are depending on government grants or foundation grants, and most of your hands would be up to some extent. I would ask you how many enjoy fundraising, and almost all the hands would go down again. And then the last question I would ask you is this. Suppose I could magically give you a choice. I could write you a $1 million check one time next year, or I could give you a business enterprise which, if you ran it well, has the potential to generate a net of a million dollars a year in perpetuity. Which would you choose? And I am betting that most of you would choose the second, because at the end of the day, you want to be entrepreneurial. Well, I believe that this is the way we should be approaching our work and the way we should be approaching economic development. If economic development were working properly, uh, it would be creating jobs, it would be raising wages, it would be uh, trying to develop more of a tax base in our communities, and it would be supporting civil society that rests on all of the above. And yet, economic development today is almost entirely about attraction and retention. One of the odd things you can do if you have a conversation with your local economic developer is just notice when you say, so what are you doing? They will say that our mission is to attract or retain business, and that, that sentence will come out at about a baud rate of once a minute. And what is weird about that sentence is it shows that economic development has nothing to do with local business. You cannot attract a local business. That is an oxymoron. And if the only way you can retain it is by paying some kind of bribe, how local is that business anyway? The woman whose picture is in front of you is Ann Markison. She's a professor at the University of Minnesota. She put together one of the best teams to evaluate, attract, and retain policies. Some on her team were supporters, some critics, some in between. And her conclusion from all of the analysis was incentive competition is on the rise. It is costly, generally inefficient, and often ineffective for winning regions. And the only reason I would disagree with this slightly is the word often. It is always 
ineffective for winning regions. And the reason is that it never considers opportunity costs. And here's what I mean by opportunity costs. Last October, I was speaking in Sarasota, Florida at a local food week, and Sarasota Florida, appropriately enough, is the home of the Ringling Brothers Circus, but I soon learned that another kind of circus was operating there in the Economic Development Department. Uh, the, the local newspaper had a headline which indicated that the Economic Development Department for Sarasota County, 10 people in all, had been doing nothing for the previous year except trying to attract an outside Danish pharmaceutical company called Zelia. And they were prepared to spend $137 million of public money to bring in this company. Now, you might think this company was going to generate thousands of jobs for Sarasota, Florida, but in fact, the number of jobs it was going to bring was 191. In other words, the county of Sarasota was prepared to spend about three quarters of a million dollars per job to attract a business. Now that is such a nutty number. It turns out, you know, if you put that same money in a low risk bond fund, you could pay a family of four a living wage in perpetuity and never need the risky company. Or another idea I had was uh, rather than pay out $137 million to Zelia, uh, you could pay 137,000 Danish people $1,000 each. Uh, to you just give them that money and they would spend that as tourists in Sarasota County and you would have a much higher economic multiplier. The point is, is that when you get to stratospheric levels of spending like this, economic development becomes nonsensical. Now this is an alternative way of doing economic development. The guy on the right in the maroon sweater is named Lou Stein. He is an economic developer in Appalachian, West Virginia. He creates, personally, 150 jobs a year. And he does this at a cost of $500 per job. Now, how does he perform this magic? Well, the first thing he does is he convenes groups of entrepreneurs together uh, several times a year. And then he rolls up his sleeves and works with them to help them execute their business plans. And the other magical thing he does is he knocks on the doors of existing local businesses and he says something that no economic developer has ever said to them before, which is, how can I help? This simple approach to economic development is a sea change difference from what is being done now. And that is what has led to my in a lot of the previous work that I've done, trying to come up with some alternative rules for economic development. And in my view, there's four rules in particular that are important. A community needs to maximize the percentage of jobs in locally owned business, maximize local self-reliance, spread models of triple bottom line success in business, and create an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And if we unpack this last point, there's sort of six P's that I lay out for successful entrepreneurial ecosystem development. And I make them all P's to make them easy to remember. Planning, people, partners, purse, purchasing, and policy making. And planning means to identify leaks in your economy. All the places where local consumers are unnecessarily purchasing outside goods and services. People means identifying entrepreneurs to lead these new local businesses that plug the leaks. Partners means creating teams of local businesses that are more competitive as a group than they would be alone. Purse means moving savings, short-term savings in banks and long-term savings in pension funds into those local businesses. Purchasing is about buy local campaigns and policy making, policy making can be as modest as let's just get rid of all of the advantages like those in economic development today for non-local businesses. Now, I must say that in the local economy movement, and I'm sure many people on this phone call would identify with the local economy movement, you know, you've been trying to execute different pieces of this agenda. But your first instinct 
is, you know, in terms of raising capital for your work, is to turn to a government grant or turn to a foundation. And the problem with this is that at the end of the day, you just don't have a lot of money and you're constantly subject to the whims of decision makers who maybe don't have uh, the same interests in mind that you do. The job we're trying to do, frankly, is too big to do this Mickey Mouse kind of approach to economic development. And I feel that a much better approach is to do what I call pollinators. Again, pollinators are businesses that have a mission of supporting the creation and the, and the uh, strengthening of other local businesses. And they are self-financing, and they enable us to do economic development work over the long haul. Now, in my book, I talk about how there are examples of pollinators in the first five Ps. I don't talk about pollinators in policymaking because the idea of a pollinator is something that's in the private sector. It might be a nonprofit or a co-op, could be for-profit, but it nevertheless is not part of the public sector. The book has 28 examples in all, and frankly, most of the models are either about food businesses or about uh, entities that are largely connected with food businesses. And I want to just give you some examples of pollinators in each of these categories so you can get a sense of of what's possible out there. In planning, this guy, Eric Koster, has a mission of strengthening local businesses through better information. Uh, he set up something called the Main Street Genome Project, which has started in Washington, D.C. He's supported by Steve Case. His first clients are 300 restaurants in the D.C. area and he's convinced them to give him his, their invoices, and he studies them and then goes to the vendors to renegotiate prices on their behalf and generally gets 15 to 20 percent savings off the supplier costs and splits those savings between the business and himself, but otherwise he charges the businesses he serves nothing, and he is starting to move his business to other communities around the United States. This fellow, Gilbert Rochescoust, is in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, it wasn't long ago that uh, Melbourne, like many cities in our country, um, pretty much was deserted at night and had people living in suburbs around the city. But the problem is, is that when the city is deserted at night, uh, it turns into uh, a, a, a environment of lots of crime and social pathology. What he started to do, though, and did this uh, under contract with the uh, various local governments in Australia, is he started to convert a failing public market in Melbourne into a night market. Uh, and suddenly there was this enormous amount of public activity occurring in the realm of local food businesses there. And he then started to take the dead alleyways of Melbourne and close them off and redesign them and brought in restaurants and other food businesses and created uh, all kinds of public spaces that have literally brought the city back alive. We all need someone like Gilbert promoting economic development in our communities. What about purchasing? These two people, Katrina and Michael Carlo Descato, um, have a buy local program that pays for themselves. They run a card, a loyalty card, called Supportland. And Supportland is used by several hundred businesses in Portland. Every time a Portlander uses this loyalty card, they get discounts on purchases uh, from other local businesses, uh, and most of the businesses are food related. Um, there are 80,000 residents of Portland right now that carry this card. It is a brilliantly conceived business and it is now spreading to other communities in North America. Another example in Canada is the guy on the lower right, his name is Colin Pape. 
Um, he grew up in a Canadian town called Midland, a 15,000 person community in Ontario. And his parents owned a paint store. Uh, in the year 2000, Walmart, Home Depot, other chains walled, rolled into town and he decided to come to the defense of his parents and other local businesses. And he created a web business called Shop Local shopcity.com. So this is an example of what he did for his own town in Midland. There are now 1,500 paying local businesses that market themselves in Midland. 25 cities in Canada, 15 in the United States are using his web technology and business model. Some cities are actually earning as much as $300,000 per year net because of this framework for doing buy local. Another example of a purchasing pollinator is this guy who I just met last week. Um, his name is Mike Auger. He runs a local goods, local food distribution service in Phoenix called Pickfly. Um, and he basically serves a bunch of local businesses, consolidates their goods, and delivers them to the door of people throughout the greater Phoenix area. People pollinators, how can we do entrepreneurship training in a way that is self-financing? Well, this woman here, Maggie Bayliss, works for a company that many of us know about, which is Zingerman's Community of Business in Ann Arbor. Zingerman's, of course, started as a deli, but created 10 linked businesses that co-license the brand, and one of them is called Zing Train, where they train entrepreneurs, and currently, uh, Maggie and Zing Train are training something like 2,000 entrepreneurs, outside entrepreneurs per year. It's a several million dollar per year business and it shows that entrepreneurship programs can be designed to be self-financing. If you're interested in youth entrepreneurship, uh, this girl here is a student in a high school in Paraguay called um, Fundacio Paraguay, actually that's the foundation that runs the high school. They acquired the high school uh, from a parish that was losing money on it in 2002 and they decided to dedicate the high school to local food businesses. So every student in the high school has to learn one of 16 enterprises how to run a dairy, how to run a restaurant, how to run a hotel, how to do value-added food processing. But these are not hypothetical businesses. These are real. They cash flow. And that cash flow underwrites the high school. This has been such a powerful model that it is now spread uh, to uh, three other communities, three other high schools in Paraguay and several high schools in Tunisia. Many of us are familiar with impact hubs. Uh, there are 65 of them around the world where people rent out space in order to develop social enterprises, many of them linked with local food. Most of these are self-financing. And another example is acceleration or incubation. This guy, Michael Looney Lives, runs something called Fledge in Seattle. Now, there are something like 1,100 incubators in North America, and nearly all of them depend on outside grants and government money. And what is terrible about that is that at the moment when you most need an incubator, the money is no longer available because there's some kind of problem in the economy. Well, he has set up his incubator in a brilliant way. He does 60 days of intensive work with the company, and when he is done, he then acquires several percentage points of equity in that company. And then that company, over the following years, can buy back that equity through a royalty payment. In other words, he has figured out how to make incubation of businesses self-financing. What about partnerships? Partnerships, again, is where teams of local business are more competitive than businesses operating by themselves. Most of, them, most of us are aware of business alliances. I was very active in the founding and spread of Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. There are some similar groups out there, like Amoeba. 
This woman, Stephanie Jackman, runs one of the very, very few Bali networks that is 100% self-financing in Calgary, uh, Alberta. And the way that she does it is not through having lots of members. In fact, she only has 120 businesses in her network. But she has become the kick-ass PR agency that all of these local businesses could not afford on, her, on their own. So she helps them get on the web, she helps them get into the local newspaper in a joint deal, she gives them uh, awards and notices in an annual ceremony, uh, and businesses are willing to pay her several thousand dollars a year for the privilege to be part of her local business network. Tucson Originals is a group of local food businesses in Tucson, Arizona. And as partners, they collectively buy foodstuffs, dishes, kitchen equipment, and thereby, through bulk purchasing, bring down their costs. Another example of partnership is kind of like a local business mall. And really, you can think of most public markets as local business malls with big emphasis on local food businesses. This picture here, of course, is from Pike Place in Seattle. It's a tourist destination that no one's going to miss. The first thing you see when you come to Pike Place is this guy tossing around the catch of the day. And we're seeing public markets spread around the country, and those that are very well designed are, in fact, self-financing. What about purse? What about capital availability? Well, first point to make is that if you have a great local bank or credit union, that should be the centerpiece of greater capital going into local businesses. Because every dollar put into a local bank or credit union is three times more likely to get into the hands of a local business, a local food business, than a dollar put into a non-local bank. One of the most impressive credit unions in North America is Man City in Vancouver. There, it has 500,000 members, most of them in the Vancouver metro area. Uh, 38,000 of those members are businesses. And because Man City has achieved this incredible scale, um, it has hired women uh, and men like this. The, the picture I have before you is Maureen Curitan, who's the green business manager. And she just rolls up her sleeves 24-7 and works with local businesses, many of them local food businesses, to improve their success, their access to capital, their ability to collaborate with one another. In the United States, you might recognize this woman, Jenny Casson. Uh, she is a colleague of mine who I've worked with for many years. Jenny has pioneered low-cost direct public offerings as a way of helping businesses, many of them local food businesses, go public, issue stock, and then sell it within the state as a way of bringing more capital into their business. We're going to hear very shortly from this woman, Linda Best, and FarmWorks, who has an impressive grassroots investment fund in Nova Scotia. And the last example I want to give you is Credibles. Many of you are familiar with Arno Hess, who runs a website, which is kind of a weird way of capitalizing business, mostly through pre-sales. And Credibles has several hundred local food businesses listed on its site, and by encouraging loyal customers to buy foodstuffs in bulk in advance, it is basically giving these businesses capital for expansion that doesn't require expensive legal filings. In my book, I talk about a bunch of policies that can be used in order to support pollinators. Um, Clearly, if we were to get rid of attract and retain policies, that would save something on the order of $100 billion a year. And that would give state and local authorities incredible resources that could then be reinvested in pollinators to help us make these local businesses much more uh, successful, much more likely to spread and to thrive. Increasingly, what this means is that the role of the Economic Development Department is not to do deal-making with outside businesses, but it's rather to try to create all of the pollinators in its 
jurisdiction and then connect local businesses to them. The point about all of this thinking is that you know, economic developers often claim, oh, you know, we support all kinds of businesses, big and small, local and non-local. But the truth is, is that economic development, like every kind of activity, has limited resources. And every dollar that is put into the pursuit of an outside business is a dollar that's unavailable for the nurturing, for the pollination of lots of local businesses. Where I want to end is with the parable of Aladdin, uh, Disney style. And you may recall that when at, uh, at, uh, in, in, in the Disney presentation of Aladdin, he rubs the lamp and out comes Robin Williams as the, the uh, lovable genie. And he says, Aladdin, you got three wishes. Now let me tell you something about these wishes. First of all, I can't kill anybody. I can't make you fall in love. And you can't wish for more wishes. But imagine if you could wish for more wishes. That is the beauty of pollinators, because rather than just throwing your money, one local business, one local food business even at a time, you're creating the pollinators, people, purchasing, purse, entrepreneurship resources that can pollinate hundreds and then thousands of these businesses. And the other really important point about pollinators is that everything that I've just shared with you and everything I write about in my book exists. And as Kenneth Boulding once said, anything that exists is possible. So none of this is make-believe. But no community has all kinds of pollinators happening in their midst. That, I believe, is the challenge for you folks. Can you support your local food businesses by creating all five kinds of pollinators? I believe you can make it happen. Let me stop there on my little card here. Uh, this is where you can get in touch with me by phone, email, or website. And I am going to then hand it back over to Jeff. Thanks, Michael. Very inspiring. Um, we're, we're all ready. <laughs> all right, let, uh, let's have this uh, great example uh, from our, our neighbors to the north. Um, let me introduce Linda. Linda Best grew up on a farm in the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. After graduating from Acadia University, she was a medical microbiologist, medical researcher, author of medical papers, presenter at research conferences. For 12 years, she operated an apple orchard on weekends while working at the hospital. She founded an art store, which grew to three stores, uh, including a production facility and 10 employees. Uh, uh, she was also director of the Capital, Health, uh, Capital District Health Authority. And while there, um, awareness of food-related health issues led to research into potential solutions for the decreasing production of food in Nova Scotia. She helped establish Friends of Agriculture, and she is a founding member and past chair of FarmWorks Investment Corporation. Corporative in, in Limited, a community economic development invest, investment cooperative that provides funding for farmers and food producers across Nova Scotia. This is what she will be talking about. In the first three years, FarmWorks has raised over a million dollars and has granted over 35 loans to food-related businesses across Nova Scotia. Linda. Thank you. I, I, oops, I, went, I went a little too fast to start with. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to have met Michael in um, Toronto some time ago and uh, at, at the Food, Farm, Fish, and Finance um, uh, conference. And I've been following his work, and we were pleased to have him here in Nova Scotia a while ago. Um, thanks to uh, the Wallace Center for allowing me to have this opportunity to tell you about Nova Scotia and while I'm at it to invite you to come here and visit um, and enjoy the food that's produced by some of the people that I'll mention as we go on. Uh, we are really pleased to be able to help pollinate some of the businesses that are helping to, to rebuild Nova Scotia's food economy. Over 50 years, food production decreased. Uh, when I was growing up, we, we produced at least 60% of the food that we are eating. Uh, farms decreased. But one of the, the key issues for rural Nova Scotia is the decrease in farm 
population from 58,000 to around 8, which has led to the loss of communities and the drop in farm and food sector employment through the, the last number of years. We just had three more schools that are going to close in Nova Scotia. We have um, uh, many farms that look like the one in this slide. We need socio socioeconomic strategies that will help to reverse these trends. We still have uh, lots of opportunities. We've got 10,000 people in farming in, and agri-food processing uh, wages from that in all food sectors that account for about 14% of our employment. 21% of the province's land area is suitable for farming, but currently probably less than half of that is in production. So we realized that a group of us friends came together and realized that we have the opportunity to, to uh, make a difference and to help to provide food for our future and healthy economic growth in Nova Scotia. So we started meeting in, in uh, late 2010. We were incorporated in 11. We started selling shares and uh, formed FarmWorks with a vision to provide, help provide healthy farms and healthy food through promoting and providing strategic and responsible community investment in food production and distribution in order to help increase access to sustainable local food supply for all Nova Scotians. And we're doing that by raising funds, um, purse pollinators, and I'll speak about the Economic Development uh, Fund in a moment. And we use that money to provide loans to food enterprises to help them increase sustainable production and profitability. And one of the key pieces is that we provide mentoring by directors, advisors, others we bring in as required. And we work with other agencies and government to, to, to um, um, help to increase the, um, the awareness of uh, food production in Nova Scotia. So the CEDAR program was legislated, the Community Economic Development Investment Fund, was legislated by government in, 2000, or in 1998 uh, to allow people to invest in Nova Scotia businesses. Uh, the program allows the sale of shares that form a pool of capital. It can't be charitable, non-taxable, or not-for-profit. At least six directors, and we have 14. And we are strictly regulated by the Department of Finance and the Securities Commission, which doesn't approve what we do, actually, but gives us what they call a non-objection that allows us to sell shares. So. Each year, the, whoops, we're, we're going a little too fast. Each year, Nova Scotians send billions of dollars out of Nova Scotia, including about 700 in each year in, in uh, retirement savings plans. And um, as um, one of the other CEDAF program chairmen has said, we send our money out of the Nova, out of the province, and then we send our children after it. The CEDAF program matches local investors with local businesses to give them access to capital and allowing them to start or stay in communities and provide jobs and services. The program should be bigger than it is, but already in, in, there is about $64 million invested by over 8,000 Nova Scotians in more than 60 projects uh, that are truly helping to fuel economic growth throughout the province. So with regard to the CEDA uh, program in general, shareholders invest for five years, another five years, another 10 for those um, provincial tax credits. The investments are also eligible um, to be put into retirement savings plans. Credits can be carried forward uh, seven years and back three years. And FarmWorks believes that the CEDA program is the perhaps one of the most effective ways we have to leverage local capital to help rebuild a sustainable farm and food economy, rebuild rural communities, and contribute to all aspects of life in the province. We have 14 directors, 
25 advisors and collaborate as widely as we possibly can across all sectors. Our first offer in 12 uh, was a less, just under a quarter of a million. Uh, our last offer was uh, over 300,000. So we have raised over a million dollars we, from 252 shareholders. We lend that money out and as, as the update um, is now 42 businesses and we are, um, we are getting, we still have, because the money goes out and comes back in, we are getting about 15,000 a month and that will soon be more as more of these loans go out. So, and at this, currently we have 246,000 uh, available to go on. So the challenges are uh, raising awareness in the general public of the benefits of local investing and gaining credibility with high net worth investors. Our shares start at $100 because we want everybody to be to have the opportunity to invest in Nova Scotia. Um, we have we have many uh, larger investments, but we we feel that everybody who invests is not only investing in farm works, but they are also investing in, in the whole idea of, of what we are doing here in, uh, to improve the economy in Nova Scotia and to make uh, more food more readily available to us. Uh, another challenge is dealing with, uh, with the retirement funds because that takes a lot of um, time and energy. We have not had much success yet dealing with registered dealer, um, dealers, and we want to raise awareness of the benefits of the CEDA program, not just locally, but, um, but across the, um, the whole of Canada. Uh, that study shown at the bottom indicated that CEDAF supported businesses have a 90% success rate, and so far we have no failures. So the way we do this, we lend qualified food-related businesses that are chosen to balance risk and achieve our strategic goals. Uh, loans are from five to twenty-five thousand. They are unsecured. That's one of the criteria for the program, and uh, payback is two to five years. No application. They must meet our sp specific criteria. We spend a lot of time on due diligence. Current interest rate is six percent, and two percent of that is for administration. 2% for any losses we may incur, um, and we hope it will never go above that, and 2% for dividends. We spend a lot of time consulting before, during, and after. We ask for annual financial statements, and uh, people can repay us. So there's no other fees other than repaying the loan. Uh, one of our very successful programs has been uh, Gentle Dragon sessions across the program where we bring together the general public with some gentle dragons, as you'll see at the bottom, and we hear from people who are either applying to or have already received money from FarmWorks. And that's very, very much enjoyed by the people in attendance, and it, it is one of the pieces of our promotion, not just of our own clients, but of the the local food producers across the province. As we spend that 50 or more hours on our comprehensive uh, evaluation, we look first at character and commitment because, as I mentioned, we are not able through the program to uh, take, uh, we could take equity, we've chosen to do loans instead, and we are not able to, um, to uh, hold um, um, collateral. So. If we see the character of commitment and if the management um, strategies are, um, are correct, uh, we can work with people to help them with all of the other aspects of that. These are the loans that we have done um, across the province of Nova Scotia. And once again, I would invite you to come and visit us if you're anywhere in the vicinity. Um, I'm just going to profile very quickly. Pi R squared was our very first loan, and they are still working in their kitchen, but they've grown to the point where they are going to make their gluten-free products um, in, in a larger facility. And um, uh, they're now they started with Heather and Ray, and now they have a huge number of people working with them. Uh, Meadowbrook Meat Market is a very large producer. 
but um, they would have had to put money into their line of credit in order to get the money for the bacon slicer that they needed, so we were able to do that. And Big Spruce Brewery uh, has done exceedingly well by establishing themselves in Cape Breton with a wonderful view out of, over the Gridora Lakes. They are now um, looking at further expansion. They're, they've uh, grown exponentially. Local Source is a distributor and a cafe, and they um, uh, many local farmers sell through them, and, and um, that is one of the, the key stores in the city of Halifax for getting local food uh, to, to our uh, to people in the city. And the pork grocer brings really brings community into the Community Economic Development Investment Fund because there was one person operating um, a small store and two people bought it with with uh, initial assistance only from FarmWorks and that there's now eight or nine people working there. There are new businesses that are going to start up in that community because of what, what we have helped to inspire there in that. So I will just quickly go through the rest of these just so that you can see the diversity of the businesses. Um, this is a wonderful province. We have some tremendous challenges. We keep hearing about them, but FarmWorks um, using local investors' money to, to uh, well, as somebody said, um, I never realized I'd be able to invest in what I could eat. And this is this is working well. We we are very pleased with the the quality of the clients, with the uh, increase in the jobs. Uh, we haven't done our most recent update, but we believe that we have probably helped to create over a hundred jobs, or create and or maintain over a hundred jobs in Nova Scotia. This this is our this was our is our youngest. He was just 15. He couldn't get money elsewhere, and we were able to um, to uh, help him with his farm. So we're enjoying what we're doing. It's very, very rewarding. We're helping to increase the food supply, uh, improve economic uh, the 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 economy, not just of rural areas, but right straight across the province. So, thank you. It's, very, it's a pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. Thank you. So inspiring. Um, so uh, I want to transition right into question and answer. We do have a, a significant amount of time for that, so uh, we have a ton of questions already in, but uh, type in your question um, for uh, Michael, for Linda, for, for both. Um, so uh, I want to address one question that I'm sure is on many people's minds, um, which is, is there something to a CEDIF in the U.S.? We have similar tax credits on the books. So, Michael, you want to address that? Right. So there's two different pieces to this question. So one is, can a state, uh, which is the equivalent of a province, do a tax credit for people who put money into qualified local businesses? And the answer is, no problem. The, the, the difficulty is, is that there are a zillion tax credits on the books, but nearly all of them are available only to high wealth, high wealth um, accredited investors, and they tend to go can you, to... Hold on. Can you, uh, there are certain numbers associated with accredited investors, uh, net worth and yeah. annual income, you want to... Sure, yeah. So, um, just a, a minute then about... Uh, background in the U.S. investment system, and this is true of Canada as well, that in the 1930s and 1920s, um, we created a system that I, I call investment apartheid. And basically what it means is that if you're in the top 1% or 2% of income earners or wealth holders, you are allowed to invest in anything, anytime, no questions asked. If you're in the other 98, 99%, you cannot put a penny into a local business unless that business has done extensive disclosures that could easily cost twenty-five, fifty, or a hundred thousand dollars in lawyers' bills. 
Um, so the, the point is is that uh, as is true with investment apartheid generally that the tax credits that have been available in the state tend to benefit accredited investors putting money into often high-tech outside non-local businesses uh, and it's just a total waste of state time and money that they're focused on that but there is no reason why a state could not create these kinds of tax credits around people focusing uh, their investments on local businesses. Now the second question is what is the ability of a state to create a system of investment funds um, like we see in Nova Scotia? And the specific problem th that we face is that um, our securities law in this respect is a little bit different than Canada because we have a specific National Regulatory Act called the Investment Company Act of 1940. And that really limits what states can do in terms of investment companies. Um, now, it turns out there, there, is, there are a couple of exemptions in the Act, and one of the exemptions is for nonprofits. So nonprofits can set up funds and not be subject to the really onerous uh, regulatory requirements of the Investment Company Act. So in principle, a state could enact something like what they have in Nova Scotia and insist that only uh, funds that are run by nonprofits administer it, and that would be legal under U.S. law right now. Okay, okay, good, That's good background. Um, okay, Linda, there are a couple uh, questions about sort of the, the internal workings. Um, uh, one question is, um, can, well, can you talk about the 6% a little bit more and the, the three sets of 2%? I think there are a couple questions about uh, uh, how you uh, afford all the due diligence required um, and uh, the rate you're paying your investors. So I, I think if you go through that, the 6% the, the rate, uh, that'll help. Okay, so we uh, we look each year at what the um, average rate is from other lending organizations, and uh, we have not changed it uh, since we set it up at six percent. Um, it is it is perhaps a little higher than it might be because of the fact that this is non-secured debt. Of that two, of that six percent, two percent is meant to pay for administration. And as you may remember from the slide that I showed um, about the directors and advisors, we are all volunteers at this point. We are building. Once we get a couple million dollars under uh, management, then we will be able to afford to hire somebody. But we built this to um, to be as as um, cost effective as possibly and of the 6%, 2% for administration, 2% for um, losses that we will uh, unfortunately probably um, uh, have and 2% is a dividend and we will pay the dividend at the 5, 10 and 15 year mark to our investors. Oh, well, that answers almost everything. One other piece was um, how much liquidity does the fund have? Um, one of the things about the fund is that because we have, as I mentioned, uh, now we have about 15000 a month coming back. And as this new group of loans uh, goes out, that will double and uh, probably more than double within about the next um, um, three months. So at any given time we have, well the way the program works is you are allowed to sell shares for 90 days. So we did that in 12, 13, 14 and we did a, an additional one in the fall of 14. So that means that we always have money coming in. We will keep on doing those offers and we always have money coming back in from, from uh, the loans. And we we have mandated that we will have at um, the four four to five year uh, we we will keep on hand a certain amount of money in case there are a number of shareholders who for one reason or other have to uh, move their money out. One thing that that we have done with FarmWorks is we have retained that 
$100 share value and and we have stated that we will pay we will always be prepared to pay shareholders back that $100. So effectively with the with the tax credits and the dividend you have protected your your capital and you are with tax credit and dividend uh, basically double, doubling your money over the um, 15 years. Excellent. Um, Michael, how is a business alliance different from a chamber of commerce? So a chamber of commerce is really quite focused on making all of the businesses happy all of the time. Uh, so chambers, you know, involve big businesses, little businesses, local, non-local, and as a result, it's very hard to have much of a coherent agenda except getting businesses together to kind of kibitz with one another. And so, you know, most chambers have become really talk shops, and that's valuable, but it doesn't do a lot. Um, and unfortunately, when you look at, say, the National Chamber of Commerce in the United States, I mean, you see a lot of lobbying for causes that are antithetical to local businesses. So the National Chamber, for example, denies climate change. Uh, the National Chamber tries to uh, protect tax uh, write-offs for big companies that are working overseas, even though it doesn't have any benefit for local businesses at all. So it's really become important for local businesses uh, to form their own group, express their own interests, and you know collaborate with one another. So that's really the, the underlying thinking of, of creation of local business alliances. Great, and can, if I can stick with you for, for a moment, Michael. Um, there are some questions about um, uh, other uh, communities, examples of pollinators in other communities. So um, if, if you can, can you address the, the following two communities? One is uh, the First Nations communities uh, and the other is more rural examples. Right. Um, well, so let me say that uh, just focusing on, on the rural stuff, so the, um, the, you know, the Fundacio Paraguaya example, of course, is a rural example. Um, and what what Linda is doing, even though there are a couple of you know cities and towns in Nova Scotia that, by and large, it's a it's a rural province, um, and you know there's really you know I I, I have um, other examples in the book um, of place uh, of places that are um, some somewhat rural. Um, I mean, really, if you look, for example, at uh, you know what Colin Pape has done with the um, with the shop city. You know many of those cities are rural in nature. Um, there's another example that I give of a um, entrepreneurship, a people pollinator, um, and some of you are familiar with him. He's probably like the granddaddy of entrepreneurship creation. His name is Ernesto Ceroli. Uh He's based in Sacramento, and he is he's like Lou Stein, he's, except he's been doing this stuff for 30, 40 years, um, and he has largely worked with very small rural communities, including rural communities in the United States, and I try to summarize um, what he's done. Another example of a self-financing rural incubator that I'm very impressed with is that the Northwest Regional Planning Commission in rural Wisconsin uh, runs a network of 10 small business incubators that's over a, an 11,000 square mile net, uh, area and they have you know these small incubators each focused on particular types of businesses and then a small staff that circuit rides over the large area so I think that's that's worth looking at as well um, in terms of First Nations I don't have any First Nations um, communities that I cover per se uh, but I will say that, you know, when I started writing this book, I probably had only identified maybe five or six of the pollinators that I ultimately wrote about. And by the time I finished, I knew of about 100. So th the truth is, is that, you know, many, many of the things that the people on this call are working on really do fit in the category of pollinators. We're just struggling to figure out what the right self-financing 
mechanism is. And I would guess that you know if we spend some time um, doing some um, uh, kind of in-depth interviews and discussions with people doing grassroots economic development in Native American uh, communities, we would find you know the the core of a number of pollinator models there. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, right now, I'm going to launch a, a little poll. It's it's the interactive part of the the webinar. Um, this is just asking uh, about interest for a, a follow up webinar or series of webinars um, with uh, with Michael to look look in more depth, more more how to um, rather than sort of an overview of the concept. So go ahead and. Uh, Click uh, as as you wish um, while I uh, turn the tables over to Linda. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask, um, can you elaborate on the technical assistance that you provide to your borrowers? By, sorry, borrowers. Sorry, borrowers. And uh, how are you uh, able to provide those services? I mentioned the uh, 25 advisors and 14 directors, and uh, we have chosen our directors to to uh, to provide a bit of a cross section of the province, but our advisors come from all walks of life, and so we are able to call on them uh, as we need them to put them in touch with um, specific people who have specific uh, challenges. But we, as I mentioned, we spend about 50 hours uh, with each each group of people. We visit them. We we get their initial application fee, which or application. Sorry, you'll see if you go to the farmworks.ca, you will see what the requirements are for their um, the specific and the general criteria. We spend about 50 hours visiting, uh, reviewing their business plan, helping them with their business plan when necessary, ensuring that they have their financial information up to date. Uh, it 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 is a lot of work. And uh, it is um, for volunteers starting off with this. Um, there are there are lots of challenges, but we are all working together, and we're all working to support these businesses. And um, so it's 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 hard work, but it's it's so rewarding that um, that nobody minds what they're doing. That's wonderful. wonderful. Um, okay, uh, okay uh, please feel free to feel continue, free to, continue to, to, vote to vote here. Um, about half of you have, uh, have put in your response about um, paying for a, a more detailed webinar. Um, uh, there's a question here about the L3C legal status, which is available in some states in, in the U.S. Um, uh, in what ways can an L3C, um, which is a, a shared use incubator pollinator a certified kitchen classroom, uh, use their legal structure to raise funds or self-finance? Michael, any ideas? Well, the, the main thing that an LC3 enables a company to do is to present itself to foundations, and then foundations can make program-related investments into that LC3 entity. Um, now, I have, I have to say, I think, you know, when you look at the law carefully, uh, foundations could do that anyway, even with vanilla-flavored companies. The LC3 maybe makes it a little bit easier. And it also needs to be said that 25 years ago, about one-tenth of one percent of foundation money was being invested through program-related investments, and today it's at exactly the same level. So it's one of those one of those ideas that just hasn't taken off. So unless there is a specific foundation that you are trying to go after and that foundation has said to you, we won't do a PRI in you unless uh, you are an LC3, it may not be worth the trouble. Um, but uh, it's, you know, the, the other thing that I think is worth saying here is that we're talking about two separate questions. So one question is, what is the function of what a business does? And if your business is doing incubation of other businesses, or if it's doing by local programs, then you're falling into this pollinator model. The second question is, what is the structure that you deploy to do it? And 
yes, you could use an LC3 or you could do a for-profit or a non-profit or a co-op, you know, and the many sub-varieties of co-op, worker co-op or consumer co-op or producer co-op. So I think these questions should be addressed separately and, and, and personally, I try to focus on the first question, the structure of what you're trying to do first, and then, you know, once you've figured out what the finance you need is in order to do what you're trying to do with your pollinator, then make a decision about what structure is most likely to connect you with the appropriate sources of capital. So let's let's stick with uh, corporate structure for a moment. Um, can you comment on public benefit corporations? Uh, public benefit corporations. So, so this is this is yes. So this is the effort to um, enshrine B corps or uh, into state public laws, and it's a little bit confusing because there's two different frameworks for B corps. So the first framework that many of us were familiar with for years is B Lab, based in Philadelphia. Uh, created a comprehensive system for companies through an interview process to um, rate themselves and and then benchmark their performance against other companies in their sector and other companies in general and then do that on a regular basis each year to see if they were improving their performance. Um, then a, a few years ago, starting in the states of Maryland and, and Vermont, uh, these states um, passed laws that would allow companies uh, to uh, basically go to their Secretary of State and get an, an additional designation uh, that they were a benefit corporation. And, and one of the reasons for doing this was to basically announce to your shareholders that here you hear you, you're not just for the private bottom line, but you're also interested and going to be mindful of the environment and your workforce and your suppliers and all these other stakeholders and you would not be a subject to lawsuits that you were not just pursuing the bottom line. So I think as a, as a general proposition being a B Corp is a good thing and it's helping to link together um, you know, more socially mindful companies with more socially mindful consumers and investors. Um, and uh, Pollinators, I think, very comfortably can be, and many are, B Corps. Okay, great. Um, so I'd like to um, ask kind of a, a, an open-ended question. Um, and uh, and Linda and Michael, please please feel free to to both weigh in. But uh, this is sort of the the future. So, what are your thoughts on the future of investments in worker uh, worker and land ownership? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in first. I mean, I I think that Sorry, I we think are I in the think midst think of. I think that a, a uh, local investment revolution uh, local here revolution. and the reason the reason for this is that um, when you look at the total amount of savings that Americans have right now it's something like 30 trillion dollars of long-term savings in stocks bonds mutual funds pension funds and insurance funds the structure of the U.S. economy is such that slightly more than half of our economy is small and medium scale locally owned businesses uh, by jobs and by output, slightly more than half the economy. And if our capital investment system was operating efficiently, slightly more than half of that $30 trillion would be going into local businesses right now. And in point of fact, almost none is. And that is a massive capital failure. And what we're talking about here, you know, with the kinds of innovations of, that Linda is doing and her American analogs, you know, local investment funds, changes in local securities laws through crowdfunding, um, Michigan just recently passed a law to create a local stock exchange. All of these initiatives are helping to fix that capital market failure. And as that failure um, gets fixed, we are going to see 
trillions of dollars move from Wall Street to Main Street. So all of us who are on this call, you know, I think can look forward to a more and more friendly capital market for the kinds of projects we are working on in the years ahead. Um, so uh, that's why, I mean, I think it behooves us to spend a little bit of our time working on the changing of these laws to open up the capital markets and the rest of our time on our favorite business or favorite pollinator. Great. Oh, all right. Um, let me um, let me direct it to Linda. You want to comment? And as I had mentioned, uh, um, a lot of money goes out of Nova Scotia every year. We've we've estimated that in from this province of about 942,000 people, we have exported more than a hundred billion dollars that is building other people's economies. We have the program. The CEDAF program does work, and the challenge for us is to use the literature, including the things that Michael is publishing, to help us to sell this to um, to our to our citizens, because we we keep hearing uh, about uh, the challenges that we have here. Michael is aware of a. Um, um, a report that has recently been done in Nova Scotia, but we have the tools, and and the challenge is to to get people to loosen their own purse strings and and make use of that tool. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank. Uh, there are uh, lots of other questions. We are. Uh, close to out of time, so I want to thank Michael and Linda for a fabulous and uh, totally inspiring uh, conversation. Um, pollinators can clearly work as efficient agents of community economic development, and due to food being fundamental to human lives, highly cultural, something that can be grown, raised, processed, and distributed effectively in almost any place and at a variety of scales. We can see the high profession, uh, potential for food businesses being uh, some of those pollinators. Um, I want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded. We will archive it on our site at ngfn.org slash webinars along with the over 60 other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to send others who you think would have liked to have heard this presentation. Uh, you can review it uh, and take some professional development time yourself and dig through our excellent archives. Uh, they are organized by topic in the left-hand navigation area and we'll, we'll have this one up in a few business days. We offer the NGFN webinars uh, every Thursday uh, every sorry every third Thursday of each month, 3:30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Sign up links are always at ngfn.org/webinars alongside of the archives. Uh, and if you get on our mailing list, we will email you a link uh, with a description. We're still putting the July webinar together, but in August we'll present a simple, valuable tool designed to step you through making the tough decisions for your business, any business, from uh, farm, food hub, uh, processor, or really any business. It's like having a consultant with you to help step you through to find the ideal solution for your business. There will be an option to automatically sign up for this webinar in the post-webinar survey. I want to let you know that the uh, that Agriculturing Marketing, Agricultural Marketing Service of USDA has for years maintained a farmer's market directory. Now they've added on-farm market directory, a CSA directory, and a food hub directory. If you or people you will work with are involved in any of these activities, please visit USDA local food directories .com, uh, and uh, enter information. Um, it's it's really a great way for uh, uh, USDA to know what's what's going on uh, out in the country uh, and uh, uh, vice versa to get your your name out there. Uh, you can find the National Good Food Network on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. Also, the Wallace Center is on Facebook. Come like us. You can search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. And if you haven't already, do sign up for our email updates. There is a link on ngfn.org homepage, but the easiest way is just let us know on the post-webinar survey. We'll sign you right up. Contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. Um, once again, let me encourage you to fill out that survey that will open in your web browser in just a moment. We do offer these webinars free to you, but we need to let our funders know about their impact. So uh, thank you. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>